Um, when I first considered uh, coming here to talk to you all today, um, I was a little bit put out by the title Everyday Radicals because I feel kind of rather more everyday than radical, <laughs> especially following the last two speakers. <laughs> um, so I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I come from a small mining village where I grew up in northeast Derbyshire. Um, I was a bit of a tomboy, probably still am. Uh, I love Lego. I still love Lego for Christmas more than anything else. I uh, haven't changed my mind. But I'm not very good at building things. It turns out I don't really have a head for design and I'm not really that creative. But I do like to build things and I do like to solve problems. I love crosswords, I love puzzles, and I can't stand it when there's a challenge there that says something can't be done. I like the idea that I'm going to be the one that finds out how to get something, how to fix something, how to find a different way to do something. Um, I'm also a bit of a geek, probably, on a number of fronts. So whether it's about learning how something works in detail in legal terms, even though I'm not a lawyer, I'll find out how to do it. If it's how something uh, is put together or taken apart, I'll have a look at it and try to hack and look into that. So these, these different crazy kind of qualities probably <laughs> come together uh, and they make me think that I'm probably best described as a civic engineer. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how there are thousands of civic engineers across the country and they have been for a very long time. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about how this starts. So my geekdom meant that I was a bit unusual. Mrs. Patel in the corner shop had never been asked for a broadsheet newspaper where I grew up. Uh, she'd certainly not been asked for a copy of The Economist. And at 14, I was a bit geeky and thought, I want to know what's in there. Um, and I did study GCSE economics before they were toughened up. And if you did that yourself, <laughs> so if you did that yourself, you'd find that there are these four founding factors of production in a modern capitalist economy or an agrarian economy. So you find land, labour, capital and enterprise. And the guys that came with me into the economics class, some of them were interested in enterprise and they went on to business school and to think about ideas nowadays, maybe they go and join The Apprentice on TV. Uh, some wants to become accountants and money men and women, bankers, look at the cash in the capital sense. And most of us sadly have to go into the world of labour one way or another. A uh, few fight for rights in that respect, but most of us labour away. But I was really interested in land, particularly. It was interested in land because it's unusual in that of the four things, it's, it's limited, it's finite, so it's infinitely contestable, okay? And I want you to keep that in mind and think about the land around here, the places you've seen as you've driven in as we go through this. She says, over a period of the last thousand years in England, but internationally, um, people have struggled and fought for land. Right from the time of William the Conqueror coming over and saying, okay, thanks guys for helping me win, which bit would you like? People have started to take land and we've, t we've seen private property rights go up and people like Queen Stanley, the diggers, the levellers, the ranters, great names for social movements in this country, have complained back in turn over many, many years saying that we want our land back, we want to do something different with our land. And it goes full circle to the Occupy movement in recent uh, times whether that's in St. Paul's, Sakoti Park, or more recently, we've seen it in the last couple of weeks in Turkey. <coughs> people are annoyed that people take their land and they lock it down for private benefit. This is a 17th century uh, anti-enclosure rant, uh, very famous, but just the first bit. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from the, off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. People should be mad that their land has been taken, their buildings have been taken, and they've been locked down for private benefit and not for the greater good. We should care because what about what the other guy will do with your land? If you look in most local economies in England now, 50% of the money spent in a local area goes to two major supermarket chains. They come in, they build something on your land, they fence it off, and they then generate profit that they take away from that local area. If you don't take your land back, if you don't think about how you spend money, how you use your resources, how we use them in common, somebody else will and somebody else will take that value away. <coughs> Over the last 10 years, there's been a massive uh, surge in interest in this, although there is a long history, as we've seen, 
of the last thousand years of people fighting back. And there are these five legal mechanisms that I've had the privilege of working with locality and national organisation for the last five years uh, that helps communities to, who, who want to take back land for public and common benefit. And the first of these is asset transfer, which is where you can take uh, land or buildings from a public body for less than its market value. Quite right. We paid for them already, right? The right to bid came in last year into force in England for the local as elect, and this allows you to nominate buildings that you care about and a piece of land. And if somebody wants to sell them, your pub, your shop, your park, your library, if somebody wants to sell them, that will be prevented for six months while we work together to raise the money, crowdfund the money to purchase them so that you can hold them in, for common ownership and common benefit. There are other uh, key mechanisms there that, that are less frequently used but still increasingly important in this regard. So how they've been used locally. So not very much, actually. But ironically, Bedford, this is the first time I've been back in five years and the first time I came was my very first case and it was to look at Bromham Mill. And five years ago, a group affiliated to Bedford Mencap, the Bromham Millers, wanted and had this great aspiration to take over the mill to help people with autistic spectrum disorders develop skills, employment opportunities, and so forth. Five years later, they're still struggling, they still don't have their mill, but they haven't given up. You've got one asset of community value, apparently. Apparently, you don't care much for what you have around you at the moment, or maybe it's just not as nice as it looked when I walked here today. So you apparently just have this one hub, and I can't believe that because I spent the evening one and it was very good last night. So you can go out with 20 friends, you can nominate us as a community value with a simple one piece of paper and send it to the council. You should have hundreds if you take something away from today get yourselves together, go out on a treasure hunt, find your assets of community value and protect them. People all over the country are doing this with fairly traditional assets, but they're also doing quite big things. So they're looking at hospitals, this is kind of chase, but there's one in Royston, not too far from here in Cambridgeshire, the Royston Hospital Action Group, big press release this morning about how they continue to try to take over the hospital there, because they don't want it to be privatised and only for private benefit and private health. In the case of Hastings Pier, the community <laughs> have saved Hastings Pier from an offshore Panamanian country, their company, company, um, which uh, left it to rack and ruin for many years, degrading uh, a particular end of the town there. And they're taking that from a compulsory purchase with £11 million pounds that they've raised to fix that up using local people's labour and input. The people at Dover are raising £250 million. Pounds. They have huge aspirations. They're not, not noticing their pubs. They're noticing their biggest asset. They're going after Dover Port and they're going to get it. I'm pretty sure. But we can always go a bit too far. A brilliant organisation, Goodwin Development Trust, £10 million pounds of assets in Hull, a poor area, so that's a lot of assets in Hull. They tried to get the Humber Bridge. They're not yet there yet. It looks more difficult than it, uh, not than it seems but it looks more difficult than it's first seen to them. But they haven't given up because Hull is the only council in the country that owns its own telephony system. And they're wondering what could we do with the telephone system is an asset. And so to leave you, I want to just say that there's maybe a future because I look young, but I went to, to school and studied economics just before the information superhighway came, okay? This is bad news for me to look this young. <laughs> And so maybe there's something that wasn't in the land, labour, capital, enterprise mix that they gave me in my textbook. Maybe there was something about the knowledge economy that's different. Where is the modern contested ground? Is it in our access to the internet? Is it in our labour being automated? Is it in capital switching to people who can and crunch lots of numbers and big data? Uh, and is it that our enterprise has been undermined as human beings and we're now looking at algorithms instead? The reason this is important is there are deprived people who cannot get access to the internet. We are being uh, limited by intellectual property rights and copyright laws in the way that a thousand years ago people were concerned about their common land being taken away. And in response, you see the Creative Commons licenses, the open data movement, and similar fights to struggle. So I want you to kind of translate the land, labour, capital enterprise into this sort of model and think about whether or not you want to create your own networks to talk to one another, as they are in Catalonia, 21,000 people connected to Griffinet, building their own wireless nodes, ignoring the corporate internet and talking to one another in their own common space. So, I leave you with this. They are selling off the air, boys, the air that's all around. And although you cannot see it and it doesn't make a sound, you can't bottle it or box it or grow it in the ground. 
They are selling off your air by the dollar and the pound. They are selling off the air, every shell that they can take, every vector, every sector, like the slices of a cake. Ingredients less visible than any you could bake, but somebody will sell it for the money they can make. They are selling off the air, not in any earthly weights, and virtual other castles on their digital estates. For the digitally homeless and the peasantry you are, they will steal the very air if you let them go that far. And your destiny is darkness if you cannot pay their rates. Now they're selling off the air as economy dictates. And they will sell the future while it still belongs to you. If the notion doesn't suit you, grab it back before they do. Thank you.